All right, everybody, welcome back. Dr. Schiller again. We are continuing with part two of our discussion of why do people get stuck with chronic pain and chronic illness. And in part one, which you might want to watch if you haven't seen it yet, it'll have the same title as this video, but it'll be part one. And we start to talk about um, the underlying physiologic imbalances that can start at birth and sort of develop during the course of a person's life that give rise to a whole constellation of symptoms that can be really disabling and difficult. And we were talking in the context of irritable bowel syndrome and fatigue and anxiety and um, like just loss of energy and brain fog. Um, but it's really generalizable to a lot of different chronic medical problems where conventional medicine doesn't have a really good view. So we're going to go into more depth about that. We brought up the concept of antecedents, triggers, and mediators. Antecedents are the early life stuff, whether it's genetics or early life events, that set the stage, that set up the physiology, and then along comes a trigger. A trigger is something that like happens at one point in life, and the trigger shifts the physiology. The trigger can go away, but the physiologic shift keeps going. And then mediators are ongoing issues. And, and this collection of issues kind of flows downstream like a river, and that's how disease develops. It flows over time. And so we're going to unpack this in a little bit more detail about how these things develop and what you can potentially do about it and where do people tend to get stuck, what do people tend to miss, and how you can be vigilant about that and make the right choices, hopefully heal and feel better. Um, but let's go back to the whole model of antecedents, triggers, and mediators. I want you to understand that so you can see what resonates for yourself. Does any of this resonate as your experience? If it does, these are things to pay attention to. So adverse childhood events, they prime the stress response. They create a, sit, a state or a situation of ongoing arousal of the stress response, the get up and go, fight, flight, freeze response. And that can actually change your genetic expression. You've got genes and your life experience changes how they're expressed. Certain people have stress genes and their parents may have had stress genes. And people who have stressed out genes tend to be more volatile. And I see this in many, many patients where they come from a volatile environment. And because their parents were fired up, stressy, like, like irritable, vigilant people, they grew up in an environment that's chaotic. And maybe there was violence or maybe there was emotional distress. And they absorb it uh, culturally and they've got it genetically. And so it builds on itself. So the whole system in adverse childhood events organizes around an overactive stress response, mentally, emotionally, behavior, physiology, gene expression. This is real stuff. And the effects are very individual. The genes load the gun, experience pulls the trigger. Someone could have stress genes and grow up in a very calm, soothing, safe environment and not express them. So, Part of the way we know this is real is the correlation studies between early life adverse events or childhood adverse events and cardiovascular disease and increased autoimmune disease, gastrointestinal symptoms, obesity, and diabetes, as well as psychiatric, psychiatric illnesses like PTSD, anxiety, depression, addictions, and other psychopathologies, stuff that makes it hard to exist and live in the world and stuff that further drives chronic illness. All of these things right here are associated with worsening chronic illness, whether it's autoimmune illness like MS or uh, inflammatory arthritis or um, <clears throat> any kind of autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so on. So adverse childhood events, can we turn down that stress response? My experience and what I've seen is yes. And there's two parts, but there's two things we want to accomplish. When we turn down the stress response, people tend to feel better. Stress and an overactive sympathetic fight, flight, freeze axis creates a sense of mal-ease. I once got an epinephrine shot. I did it when I was a resident just to feel what it was like because we used to give them to people with allergic responses. And it's just like, Ooh, it feels horrible. Like you feel like you're going to die. And if you've ever met anyone who has panic attacks, that's an overactive stress response and they feel like they're going to die. They can't breathe. Their chest gets tight 
and it's too much adrenaline and epinephrine and it's a real thing and it's one of the things that can happen with adverse childhood events it's one of the things that can be turned down over and over again it's been shown in various research the next question is changing the actual disease course and again i'm seeing yes in my clinical practice and there's some evidence in the medical research that when we turn down the stress response if you go back to that previous diagram with everything's connected we potentially turn down some of those vicious cycles so another antecedent that's a big thing is biome disturbance i mentioned the biome before the biome is all of the bacteria that live all over your body but especially in your gut and you know philosophers from thousands of years ago were talking think people like hippocrates and maimonides were talking about how good disease starts in the gut and that's what modern research is starting to show us that there's this profound influence of your biome and all of the variables that it affects on your state of health or disease and so you got more bacteria in your gut than human cells you probably know this by now because it's all over the newspapers it's all over the medical research and literature and um, why do people have biome disturbance as an antecedent what happens early in life well there's genetic predispositions someone who has a c-section um, they don't get populated with bacteria like they do during that descent through mom's vaginal canal that vaginal delivery is part of what primes the biome of the person's whole body tonsillectomy shifts things lots of antibiotics shifts diet stress response trauma this shifts the biome and what are outcomes of biome biome disturbances are associated with changes in your immunity and your neurotransmitter function that's what helps your brain communicate with all of your immune cells in your whole body your metabolism the way that you process nutrients the way you process sugars diabetes brain function mental illness um, and so that's why we've got all these disease outcomes from dysbiosis which is a change in that biome and so up here it's talking about parkinson's in the brain area it's talking about parkinson's alzheimer's multiple sclerosis depression anxiety chronic pain stress um, endocrine issues like hypothyroidism muscle stuff like losing muscle rheumatoid arthritis other autoimmune diseases this isn't the best diagram in the world but it is showing some of the well-known illnesses that are associated with dysbiosis inflammatory bowel disease irritable bowel syndrome ulcerative colitis colitis lots of morbidity and mortality obesity and type 2 diabetes these are some of the biggest drivers of chronic illness in the world and they're linked to dysbiosis are you listening yet so all right we talked about antecedents let's unpack triggers triggers are events that shift the system they modify your metabolism change your immunity they can affect your biome organ function beliefs emotion behavior gene expression and function they're the boom that happens right and triggers could be trauma illness infection toxin or drug exposure or psychosocial events when someone's traumatized by another person when someone even has a a move to another country when they lose their business when they go through a pandemic of some kind of viral infection that the world doesn't understand and there's isolation and lockdown that is a trigger and that's part of why people are getting sick and mentally ill right now in you know December 2020 when I'm recording this video the triggering event comes and goes but its effects can persist this is one of the most misunderstood issues right because the trigger shifts the system and so many times I've sat with a person and we've talked about you know their disease process and how yeah it came on right after you know I moved or I got really sick and I had um, this like bowel infection and when I went to India and I had a parasite or um, they got a bunch of antibiotics or they had a traumatic event or a surgery and then suddenly things started to kind of unwind and I'm like, that's a trigger. That's part of what caused the problem. We're like, but wait a second, that was 15, 20 years ago. But yeah, okay, the triggering event comes and it shifts. And it shifts and creates a shift in the physiology. And then the disease process rolls downstream. And we see this stuff all the time. I hope that makes sense to you. So think about triggering events. What was the event? Was it infectious? Was it psychosocial? Was it some other kind of trauma? Was it a drug or toxin exposure? 
Were you working in a plant where you were exposed to gases from heavy metals? These are all things that are part of the process of unraveling that disease process that flows downstream. Okay, triggering stress event. Let's unpack this because I see this so many times. I see a lot of people with chronic pain, fatigue, fibromyalgia, IBS, and chronic, an acute stress event is so often part of what triggers them. We've pretty much talked about all this stuff already. Genetics plus early trauma, we called it adverse childhood events, leads to this chronic stress activation, dysfunction of that um, cortisol and adrenal system, frequently sleep disturbance. These things all feed into each other. If I'm hypervigilant walking through my life and I'm looking for danger to protect myself from it all the time, I'm going to experience things as more dangerous. I've sat with so many people who have PTSD that's complex. And 5, 10, 20 years later, they have an event that most people wouldn't be so bent out of shape about. But for them, it becomes a re-traumatizing experience because it re-stimulates the early traumatic experience and it feeds into a stress system that's already on overdrive. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this whole adrenal output, the adrenaline or noradrenaline, the cortisol. And so frequently that seems to kind of go up with time. And I've talked to so many people where they're like Energizer Bunny. They had that early stressful life experience or something that happened at a certain point in their life. Maybe it's genetic. And they're kind of like overdrive, going, 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 right? And they're getting more and more stressed as life gets more complicated. They have kids, they have a job, they're dealing with various challenges. They're starting to get older, things are difficult, other stressors come in. Um, and then at some point, there's a trigger event. And again, the trigger event could be physical trauma, um, illness, interpersonal trauma, toxic event, whatever it is. And then there's a peak in their stress event, stress in their stress function, and then they crash. And they get to this state that we call adrenal hypofunction. And that's when they start to get more significant systems dysfunction. So we see this all over, all over the place. And so many people who have these chronic kinds of issues that someone especially who's got an underlying kind of ongoing stressful picture because of the early life experience, their genetics, their ongoing habits, their behavior, substance abuse, whatever it is, and then boom, trigger, crash. And they're like, what happened? I had a minor car accident and everything's unraveling. What happened? You know, I got married. It wasn't so bad, but gosh, I started feeling sick. Or what happened to me? I was doing great and I had an elective procedure and it went all wrong and the wound didn't heal. And like all the time <laughs> when you look for it, you see it. So I want to encourage you to just think in your own life. Is that significant for you? And what kind of trigger was it? So let's go forward. Um, again, I want to share this information with you so you get to know I'm not making it up. This is from, I should have put this on the other side, Frontiers, and I think it's like, uh, what? Oh my gosh. Slide dysfunction. Right, okay. Frontiers in neurology. We're talking about, here is that hypothalamus, and here is that pituitary gland. We look at this before. This is that feedback loop that the hypothalamus drives the pituitary to secrete stuff from the adrenals, especially cortisol, and that's your stress response. And there's feedback, right? These little red dotted lines say that as the cortisol goes up, you get feedback into the system that slows it down. And again, any kind of stressor. It can be an interpersonal stressor. It can be a biochemical stressor. It can be an infection. It can be a drug reaction. What happens over time, if there's an increased overload of stress, is that you get a suppression. This system kind of gets bent out of shape and there's impairment in that feedback. And there's also evidence more recently, it's not reflected in this slide, but that many people develop what we call resistance to cortisol. It's a cortisol receptor down regulation where their system doesn't respond as well to the cortisol that they have. Part of the confusion of early research looking at this whole axis and what happens with chronic illness is that some people have decreased cortisol levels and some people have normal cortisol levels, but they look like they've got decreased cortisol levels. What's going on? Part of what can be going on is that their cortisol receptors become downregulated. 
So this is a little bit out of date, but I just wanted you to kind of get a big picture of how this thing shows up to alter the stress response. And let's put that together with your immune regulation, right? This is normal, right? Here's that stress response, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, cortisol re release blocks inflammation. If you've ever had some kind of inflammatory problem or an inflamed joint or an autoimmune disease, frequently a doctor uses cortisol. We use cortisol to treat infections of the lungs. Steroid-like medications are one of the main things right now that's being shown in clinical trials to help with COVID when people are really sick in the hospital. Cortisol and related chemicals are immune suppressors. What they do is modulate the overactivity of the immune response. If you go out and you run three miles, you stress yourself to a good amount, right? I mean, if you've never run, don't do this at home. But if you're an athlete and you run three miles, you're tired, but you feel good, you are pumping up your immune response. Your immune cells localize and activate and they're ready and it actually stimulates your immune functioning. But when stress is chronic, it actually screws up your immune functioning. So let's understand why. You get that stress response from that acute uh, exercise that you do. A little while later, your cortisol kicks in and kind of quiets it down. Like, okay, boys, don't attack the body. You know, you, you know it activates the stress for acute issues, but it quiets it down for, for chronic issues. And then when there's chronic stress pathology, kind of we've seen this before, but I just want to share here that there is this influence on the immune cells. This is the Journal of Basic and Applied Science from six years ago. And so we've got that, again, that HPA axis and release of cortisol and, and there's too much of it basically. And you get this feedback that's going to your brain from your immune system. We show that in the initial picture at the beginning when we were looking at the brain and seeing how cytokines, inflammatory chemicals, can actually worsen stress responses. And that also acts through what we call the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, which are kind of like the nerve branches that are meant to be balanced but get dysregulated. And when things get really bad, when the stress is chronic and persistent, we get that cortisol resistance, like I mentioned earlier. And because the cortisol resistance, which could be part low cortisol release and part low responsiveness to cortisol, that the immune system kind of gets out of control. And instead of being like, okay, immune feedback in the orange zone, immune feedback starts to be the red zone. And this doesn't happen to everybody, but in the people with chronic widespread pain, the people with chronic various kinds of pain or irritable bowel where there's this pain sensitivity response, that seems to be part of what's going on is that inflammation is affecting the brain. Okay, let's go a little further here. Mediators, right? Persistent changes that keep you sick. Metabolic stuff, biochemical stuff, mental, emotional, social, behavioral. We talked a little bit about this already. Hormonal dysregulation. This, this is what we see. These are the kind of media. This is sort of the principles, and this is what we really see. We talked a bit about cortisol dysregulation, whether it's actual cortisol secretion or the resistance to the cortisol in the cells, chronic pain, irritable bowel, and then the habits that people have, whether it's social isolation or violence or um, dietary habits, eating lots of comfort foods or eating foods that are just like unhealthy for whatever reasons, substance abuse issues. These are things that happen when someone's triggered and it's part related to antecedents, their culture, their early life experience, and those triggering, triggering events that kind of shift the system and create this sort of wave rolling downstream. <clears throat> Other mediators, like we, we talked about already a little bit, is dysregulation of the immune system, dysbiosis, anxiety, depression, chronic infection. Think about the vicious cycles affecting all of the system. Not sleeping well. One of the best reasons you can develop chronic pain is just don't sleep. If you don't sleep, you're going to get chronic pain. When you go into deep sleep, stage four sleep, it takes a couple hours to get there typically. Um, that's where your body regenerates itself. And if you keep waking up every hour or two, you're not going to even get that deep stage sleep. If you're taking benzodiazepines and sleeping drugs, or you're putting yourself to sleep with alcohol, you're not going to get to deep stage sleep. Your body's not going to rejuvenate itself. In fact, what it's going to do is wear itself down more and more. And that's part of this 
river flowing downstream with these chronic changes. So, mediators, irritable bowel syndrome becomes a mediator as well. It becomes a cycle in itself that happens. And that's one of the presenting complaints of Robert, who we started talking about, is that he's got cramping pain. He has to run to the bathroom. He can't go out to an appointment in the morning because he might have to go have diarrhea at any moment. It's profoundly disabling, and I've heard that from so many people. It's very, very difficult. Pain, cramping, bloating, gas, diarrhea, or constipation, and no other identical disease. This is really big and important. Functional medicine is about chronic illness, and if you have a more serious illness, you also need to do that. When someone comes to me and say, hey, I think I've got IBS. Well, did you see a gastroenterologist and get it worked up? No, I didn't. Well, don't come to see me. Come to see me after you've made sure that you don't have chronic pancreatitis or inflammatory bowel disease or an ulcer that might bleed. Sure, we can treat those with a functional approach, but your level of vigilance and what you need to do to stay safe and be healthy is a completely different picture if you've already developed an end or a disease. And that's true about autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. If a person has one of those diagnoses, they Here's need to be under the care you got of someone who is trained food particles and come thinking down about and the end organ damage the cells that can happen. Through the and cells what do we need to do pathway. now to deal with that end organ damage? Your, so the person's joint don't joint your blood okay. system here and so get the person does the body. Need from this little tube is inside your bowel. It's really so the outside of your body. See the conventional doc. The inside is really your outside. In this case, so GI. When After that, that barrier said, look, is intact, you've got irritable the right bowel, stuff gets then through, we can start and the wrong thinking, stuff doesn't through. get through. Or you've got inflammatory bowel disease, and, dysfunction, and, you've got and intestinal we don't need to treat it, or we do need to treat it with these drugs. That okay, a, start a, with the drugs. bigger gap. The healing the process, process takes longer. And sometimes it breaks down the cells themselves. So you've got bacterial compounds, you've got large food particles. So let's talk about what causes all sorts of stuff that's sliding through. this is getting not only into your average doctor's not going all over your body, but it's getting into the immune cells which are abundant, abundant, the, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, it's GALC, it's hard to put it and together. that's like all it's around your immune system, and it's monitoring everything that crosses so over, and if you have too much stuff crossing over, you got bacterial proteins and compounds passing really over, your immune system is going to get inflamed. That's going to affect your gut function, and that's going to go to your entire body. And that's why intestinal permeability is associated with happens. every chronic illness. When I was in training, we used to laugh at it. That's what the freaky, crazy little bit dogs talk about. That's what we said. That's what we tried. And now if you look in almost every specialty journal, they'll talk about intestinal hyperpermeability or barrier dysfunction as it relates to autoimmune disease if you're a rheumatologist, neurologic disease if you're a neurologist, psychiatric disease if you're a psychiatrist, and so on and so on. All the specialties are seeing that our chronic illnesses are related normal, to intestinal right? hyperpermeability and barrier dysfunction. And that's part of the healing process that a person needs to address. Which is, has to do with how the, how the All right. System surrounding your gut. Progress in Neuropsychopharmacology and Biological Psychiatry 2021. It's only 2020, but you know how this happens. This kind of puts it together from a scientific point of view. Here's your brain central nervous system. And here's that HPA axis secreting cortisol, acting on your immune cells, acting on your gut. And here's your gut biota, all those bacteria that are producing all sorts of compounds that nourish your body or make your body sick. When they're sick, they produce compounds that actually are toxic to your brain. Um, that gut biota, if it's healthy, modulates and keeps your immune system healthy. But if it's not healthy, it makes your immune system overactive and you get inflammatory chemicals going to your brain, which can activate your HPA axis, which can make your brain sick. When your gut is not healthy, when your gut is healthy, you produce neurotransmitters that affect different aspects of your brain. And when you're not healthy, you produce the wrong ones. You alter your neurotransmitters. Um, and here's that other aspect of the sympathetic pathway, right? The vagus nerve, which is parasympathetic, the relaxation response, the rest and digest. And then the spinal pathways, which is what we call the sympathetic nerves, which is that fight, flight, freeze response, which not only affects your gut, but affects every cell in your body. This little thing is just a blow up of what's going on in your gut. So summing up, this diagram is just showing you like this stuff is all connected in a cyclic way where what's happening in your stress response 
is profoundly influ influencing your immune function as well as your gastrointestinal, your just your your bio microbiota, potentially for developing ir irritable bowel and leaky gut syndrome, affecting neurotransmitters, producing either stabilizing your toxic metabolism. And this is looking at all that in the context of pain, right? And so. This is from CNS Neuroscience and Therapy 2016, the gut-brain axis, my, the microbiota gut-brain axis and visceral pain. And this is illustrating what we've already really talked about, which is that stress influences your microbiota and your microbiota feeds back into your stress response. And stress influences your pain sensation system and the way your body processes pain. And that's a two-way street. And your microbiota Probably, but they're not really sure yet how it might be affecting the actual pain in your gut. And this is happening through that HPA axis. Look down at the bottom here. Altered neurochemistry, changes in your immune system, gut hormones, and dysbiosis. And we didn't talk so much in detail about this, but, you know, that's the story. Visceral pain. And this is another way of looking at it in cartoon form. I'm sharing the same ideas in different perspectives so you can really get it, right? Stress response acting on the brain, driving this hypothalamic pituitary, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which over time gets dysregulated potentially, and is in part leads to peripheral sensitization, so your gut gets more sensitive. The normal stretch that my gut has will hurt and be cramping and painful in someone who doesn't have a sensitization of your gut. Um, and that happens because there's these different pain pathways in the spinal cord that affect how sensitive the system is and are very sensitive to stressors and the other issues we talked about like immune dysregulation and you also can get central sensitization in the brain itself so let's just unpack this again i, th I think i showed you this already but just to look at it more closely here is your 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 peripheral nerve coming from your hand so to speak going to your spinal cord and you've got these little synapses here which transmit the signal and then that goes up to your thalamus, and your thalamus is processing information from every part of your body, your emotions, your thoughts, your um, all of your sensation, your joint position sense, your entire being is processed through your, your thalamus, and that influences how your body processes pain. You've got inputs to there that are going down to the spinal cord from your emotional arousal centers, from that at places that are um, modulated by immune function, modulated by stressors, mod modulated by motivation and purpose and meaning. And so pain is a very modulated thing, which means you can turn those processing systems up or turn them down. Okay, so chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia synd syndrome, I'm just gonna like unpack this a little bit, right? And, and put these antecedents, triggers, and moderating fractures in, in, in context, right? So what is that syndrome? And again, I'm not trying to say, you know, there's a lot out there in the literature, chronic fatigue is different than fibromyalgia. It is because there are certain things that are different about people who develop chronic fatigue versus people who develop fibromyalgia, but a lot of the underlying physiologic changes are shared. And these changes are shared with other chronic pain states and neurodegenerative states. And so this is not just relevant to chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, it's relevant to almost any chronic illness, right? And in the syndromes of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, there, are, there can be pain, that tends to be fibro, can also be chronic CFS or ME, but sleep issues, fatigue, GI problems like we talked about, these are the symptomatic things that are going on. These are the things that someone goes to their doctor with. But they start with antecedents, and they're activated by triggers, and then they're promulgated by mediators. And this is a process that happens over time, right? Where the mediators can be a trigger, and the trigger can generate the mediators. And what are we talking about? Genetics, early life trauma, illness, exposure to chemicals or drugs early in life, um, lifestyle issues, cultural issues. And triggers are things like trauma, illness, viral, toxic, infectious, gastrointestinal injury, surgery. And mediators are stuff we've been talking about. Inflammation, central sensitization, changes in your mitochondria or your um, hormonal axis, immune system changes, gastrointestinal, and then the behavioral stuff like 
social stuff and are you isolated, miserable, depressed? And where does that feed into the system? Do you have a social support system? Do you have meaning and purpose in life? Those are incredibly important to shifting and enabling a person to actually function and live a successful life. Um, nutritional, obviously, are huge. And so that's the vicious cycle. Okay. So, again, just painting this picture again. Early life stressor, genetics, trauma, stress system overactivity, shift in the gut-brain axis, the issues we talked about that show up often as irritable bowel and sometimes not, motility, barrier permeability issues, the biome issues, feeding back into the brain function, that's that gut-brain axis, feeding into infl inflammation dis and the immune dysregulation, feeding back into the brain function, malabsorption potentially if someone's sick enough in their gut and they're not getting nutrients they need, and all of that's feeding into fatigue and pain. I think I forgot to put pain there, but that's part of the picture, and that feeds back into the system. Yeah, mitochondrial dysfunction is part of that too. So this is what we're talking about. This is the terrain under which genetic chronic illness is generated. So like we've discussed, these are some of the things that were relevant in Robert's case to his IBS, his fatigue, uh, anxiety, difficult sort of life and hard to get things done and move forward in his life. Um, and these antecedents, triggers, and mediators are involved in a lot of different disease processes. There's more than this, it can be broader, and there's a lot of variability to it. And that's part of the detailed evaluation that we try to do when we're looking at someone who's got a chronic challenging problem from a functional point of view. Um, but so, again, the antecedents, triggers, and mediators can show up in a lot of different disease processes. And so these are some of the things we see that obviously these have different names. There are different diseases like chronic pain or fibromyalgia, abdominal pain, fatigue, depression, anxiety, migraine, neurodegenerative diseases like uh, dementia, multiple sclerosis, other even ALS, um, neuropathy, dementia, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or even Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, chronic fatigue, um, ME, and so on. These are diagnoses that we give these things in conventional medicine, but when we look at the underlying issues that are showing up in the research to be involved in driving the processes that give rise to the symptoms that get named with these disease names. And so that's the piece I'm trying to get across to you, that it's so important to understand that the underlying issues are really where the money is in terms of that it's so important to understand that the underlying issues are really where the benefit is in terms of the things that you have some influence over to work with it. For sure, if you've got a conventional doc who has things to offer that are more typical in terms of meds or procedures that are meant to slow or stop or address these issues, those can be very relevant. But when you get to the end of the line and the conventional doc saying, okay, we've done all we can, there's not really much else to do for you, or the things we're doing for you are giving you side effects that are not working, um, that's when it's really important to look at this underlying sort of functional picture. And that's often the place where people are stuck because either they're sort of in the allopathic mode and they think that that's it and those are their only options, or they've gone down the road towards trying to do something more lifestyle and holistically oriented, but they haven't done enough of a complex investigation into all the potential underlying causes and the triggers and mediators that potentially are treatable. So I think that's enough for now on this video. Um, the next question, of course, we want to know, what are we going to do to help Robert? What are we going to do to help people who are in a similar situation? And you may have seen some of my other materials where I talk about the three M's, the mind-body system, the movement system, the metabolic system. These are like three handles on your physiology you can see in the diagram how they're interpenetrating with each other. These circles all intersect. And in the middle, there's that sort of vitality, that aliveness, that you, that we can't measure, that's beyond our understanding. But nonetheless, it's part of what's driving the healing process. Um, and if you can mobilize your drive, your motivation, your yearning to live, your learning to be connected, and address these three different aspects of 
your overall health physiology, that's frequently where the healing process happens. So in the next vid, we'll unpack the three M's. We'll talk about what these three things mean in the context of these um, antecedents, triggers, and mediators that we've been talking about. Um, and also I'll talk about the things that I see that many people miss in these three different realms, which frequently are part of what keeps them stuck. So thanks for watching. I hope it's been good for you. Uh, if you like it, be sure to subscribe either to my newsletter blog thing or on the YouTube channel so that you get notified when new things come up. And, um, and tell your friends, tell your family, and I look forward to seeing you again. Feel free to shoot off any questions you've got. You can do that through the website. Um, and wishing you all the best. Take care.